Good evening, Lifeline family. So let us start with the prayer first. But Father, we want to thank you for the gospel of God's righteousness. It's because of Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, we can come boldly to your throne of grace. And Father, we pray that you use me mightily. May your double portion of anointing be upon me as I speak. Father, whatever that is spoken will be of you. And Father, open up the hearts. They will listen and hearken to your word and take heed of your word. Even in these last days, they will remember and put your words in their hearts, and it will last them to eternity. Father, I pray and I commit this entire service into your loving hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So first of all, I'd like to thank Pastor and also Sister Ern, and also I'd like to thank God for giving me his revelation knowledge. Amen. And today is the first week of June. And we have entered into a new focus, which is hope. Hope, okay? So last month, we have promises. And promises and hope actually comes together. Because when we know the promises of God, when the promises of God, the knowledge of the promises of God increase in us, then the hope that we have towards what God has promised and the hope towards eternity will increase in us. It will be more assured in our hearts as well. So last month in Promises, we heard about my God, the promise keeper. In there we saw God's character and hope in faith, like Abraham hoped in faith. When all things fail, when he cannot hope on anything on this side of this world, he hoped in faith alone. And that we too must exemplify. And last week, Sister Erna shared the heavenly bank account. So from Ephesians chapter 1, we see so many that we have. We have been redeemed, we have been adopted, we have been sealed with the long-promised Holy Spirit, and many more that God has placed in us. And are we claiming that promises? Okay? And today, we are looking at hope. What does hope mean? Hope means the confident expectation of what God has promised and in His character. So there is a confident expectation of what God has promised He will fulfill and in His character that He will never lie. Whatever that He has promised, it will come true. That is why we can hope. That is why our hope never fails, because our God never fails. Amen? In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, Apostle Paul writes, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. That means that if our hope is only for on this side of this world, oh, what a pity if you can only hope on this side of this world, on the things of this side of this world. Because here it's talking about, if you say that Christ has not resurrected, then there is no hope. Where there is hope, there is no hope to eternity. But Paul is saying, thereafter we can see that there is a hope beyond the grave. In Christ, there is a hope beyond the grave. And today I've entitled my message as Hope Beyond the Grave. So hope is the confident expectation in what God has promised. So a confident expectation of what God has promised beyond death. Even after when we pass from this side of this world, we have that hope in eternity. Amen? And in John 11, verse 25, it says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And God promised that there is life after death. Actually, once we have passed from this side of this world, our true life begins. A true bliss of life begins with Christ. That's why it says, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. He who only believes in me, even though he may die from this side of this world, but he shall live. When God says shall live, you shall live in eternity. 
And let me bring you to my first point. Today we have the ever-living hope. So in this ever-living hope, which is the everlasting or the eternal hope we have in Christ, this hope does not disappoint. This hope will not fail us. Sometimes we might think that I'm hoping for something to happen. But why is it not happening? Why? Why God? But God says, my thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. And whatever that God has planned and purpose in his timing, that it will come to pass, it is far more better than what we think it will be. As spoken in Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We must always believe as a born-again child of God, His thoughts are greater. His thoughts are always good towards His elect. Nothing, no bad things that happen in your life comes from God. We must believe that because God's plan is to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. As in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. When God says that in the Old Testament, His word never fails. His word will continue until the end. Even to the last man on this side of this world who believes in Jesus, baptism, death, and resurrection, his thoughts towards you are always good. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, of future and of hope. So that today, when we look towards the future, we know there is a hope beyond the grave. Amen? And today, God has bestowed upon us an ever-living hope, the hope of eternal life true and only true Jesus Christ. And I've taken my passage from 1 Peter 1 verse 3 to 5. In the Amplified Classic Version, it says, the ever-living hope that we have. Okay, so in verse 3, it reads, All honour to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is His boundless mercy that has given us the privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's own family. Now we live in the hope of eternal life because Christ rose again from the dead. And God has reserved for His children the priceless gift of eternal life. It is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And God, in His mighty power, will make sure that you get there safely to receive it because you are trusting Him. It will be yours in that coming last day for all to see. God bless His word. Let us look back in verse 3. So in this passage of scripture, the first point, the ever-living hope, there is five sub-points from this passage itself, okay? So the first one, it says, All honour to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is His boundless mercy. So the first sub-point is, is God's mercy. It's not because of who we are or how perfect we are or we are born into this world so pretty, so beautiful, so handsome. Once you come out, we're like, whoa, such a handsome child, such a beautiful child, such a cute baby. It's not because of that. But it is God's mercy. God's mercy from the beginning up until the end. God's mercies flow. His mercy will never end. And it's because of His mercy, then that second sub-point, that has given us, in this version it says, the privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's own family. And this version caught my attention because it says that because of God's mercy today, we have the privilege of being born again. It's a privilege to be born again. Sometimes we just think that, ah, uh, through Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, I'm born again. 
But do you know that it is a privilege to you? Like when you go to a theme park, right? You need to pay extra to go to that. What's it called? A fast lane or some lane lah, that you go so that there is not much queue. But here, God gives you the privilege to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Because we know how are we to be born again. It says in John 3 verse 5, right? You must believe in the water and the spirit to be able to enter the kingdom of God. So it is a privilege to be born again to be able to enter the kingdom of God. And this water and spirit is Jesus' baptism, death and his resurrection because the Spirit of God is the one that testified. The water, Jesus' baptism, when John the Baptist represented all mankind to lay his hands upon the body of Jesus and all of our sin, past, present, future, whatever thoughts that we have, that sin that goes against God, all has been passed unto the body of Jesus. And he walked that life for us so that we can exemplify his walk. And he died on that cross because the wages of sin is death. And today, we do not pay, need to pay that price anymore because once and for all, Christ has perfectly paid it all. And when he was resurrected, we was resurrected in the newness of life. Only in that new life, we are of privilege. Privilege in the kingdom of God. And it says privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's own family. Isn't that great to know that we are part of God's family? We are His family. Just imagine if you're the son or a daughter of a king. You will think that, oh, I have so much privilege. Wherever I go, they will just make way for me. Like how the police always go in front, right? Everybody, the commoners will make way for them, right? So similarly, we as born again child of God, we have that privilege. And God has sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to purchase us to be his children, part of God's family. And the third one is, so now we live, now as a born again child of God, we live in the hope of eternal life because Christ has resurrected. It's only because Christ has resurrected we have a hope beyond the grave. We have the ever-living hope, the eternal life, the hope of eternal life. So in verse 4, it says, God has reserved for His children the priceless gift of eternal life it is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. So the fourth one is, here it says, once we are born again, we live in the hope of eternal life, God himself personally reserved that gift of eternal life for his children, only for his children, not for anyone else, but his children. God has personal interest in all of us. And God is safeguarding this ever-living hope only for His children, for His beloved. Okay, And the fifth one is, in His mighty power, He will make sure that you get there safely to receive it because you are trusting Him. If you have faith in Him, you trust in God, you hold on to this gospel truth, God Himself is the one that will secure your salvation. He's the one that will get you there safely to receive this eternal hope. A hope beyond the grave that we will never lose this faith. So in this portion of scripture, it speaks about when we are born again, it's all by God's mercy and we have the privilege to be part of God's family. Then only today we can live in the ever-living hope, in Christ himself. And the outcome of this ever-living hope is the assurance that God himself is safeguarding that and he is the one that will bring us back home when the time comes. 
And through the gospel of God's righteousness, which is baptism, death, and resurrection, we have hope beyond the grave. And the sermon on the tribulation also enlightened on the resurrection of life. So in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 to 18, it also speaks about the hope that we have beyond the grave. In verse 13 it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Least you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Amen. God bless his word. So let us see back in verse 13. It says, Let us who are born again, who are alive, let us not be ignorant concerning those who have passed before us, those who are born again, who have fallen asleep, least you sorrow as those who have no hope. But we and those who have fallen asleep before us has a hope beyond the grave. We all have a hope because we know that one day we will meet them face to face again when we hold on to this faith up until the end. And if we believe that Christ died and rose again, he will also bring with him those who have asleep in Christ. So in this verse, it talks about the dead in Christ will first be raised and those who are alive and remain will be caught up and met with Christ. So we also learn that in the Sermon the Tribulation. So in the end, we have a hope beyond the grave so that when our loved one pass away, we know that we will meet them face to face again. And it is not a failure. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 to 55, similarly, Paul also writes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. And we've seen this in the tribulation, where the last trumpet means we need to go through the mid-trip, mid-tribulation. And at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So in this verse, it talks about the incorruption and the immortal will swallow up the corruptible and the mortal, which is this flesh. We all yearn to meet Christ face to face. And in this side of this world, there is a struggle, there is a pull between the flesh and the spirit. We want to serve God, but yet sometimes the flesh pulls us back. But all the more, we need to focus and walk in the spirit so that we are more and more like Christ, so that daily we can proclaim that death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? Because daily we have died to Christ and resurrect in the newness of life. As Paul always said, daily I die. I die daily so that I can live for Christ. That's why he can boldly say that, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Without that, how can one say, imitate me? Because in the flesh, we know that we are weak, we are vulnerable, and we always sin. But in the spirit, when we die to our flesh, in the spirit, we can serve our one and only true living God. And many more can imitate our lives. Amen? And today, we know that death 
for us is a victory because only through dying to this, from this side of this world, we can truly experience the fullness of Christ. And today we believe in Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. And that is the victory over death. And daily, we are spiritually made alive. And once we have the assurance of the ever-living hope, the hope of eternal life, all the more we ought to live out this life. As Paul says, let us live worthy of this gospel truth. And in Galatians 2 verse... 20. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So here, Paul writes that daily I've been crucified with Christ. I've been all my sin has been passed unto the body of Jesus Christ and Christ has died for me. Today, I too when I have united with Christ. I too have died. It's no longer I who live, but Christ is the one that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So daily, our life today is by faith. Today, our life is not by sight, but by faith. Faith in what God can do. Sometimes uh, we might think that it is impossible. And we might be like Abraham and Sarah, right? Mock. And think, how can this be possible at this old age? But with God, all things are possible. And it says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. With that, I'll bring you to my second point, which is to live is Christ. And we have seen that in Philippians 1 verse 20 to 26. It says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So here, Paul says that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Meaning, no matter whether he's alive or he die, it is all for the glory of God. His entire life, up until his death, he wants to glorify God with his life. That's why you can say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. God bless his word. So Paul is saying here that if I die, it is of gate. It is far more better to his knowledge. But it is more necessary for me to be alive here because I am able to see your progress in joy and the progress in your faith to strengthen you and to encourage you that so many churches that he has planted throughout Asia Minor, his hard work that he wants to put in for the gospel truth to expand the kingdom of God on this side of this world, that keeps him going. And that is why God kept him longer and longer and longer up until the time when it is his time God brought him back home. But at that period of time, to live is Christ. Let us all also exemplify how Paul lived. That today we live. Yes, we have that eternal hope. What are we going to do? 
with that eternal hope. Yes, we know that we have the ever-living hope in Christ. What about the people around us? Our friends, our family. Let us not wait until it's too late to share this gospel truth. Because only at this lifetime that they can receive this gospel and hold on to this gospel, where they can also have that hope and the peace in them, knowing that when they have their last breath, they are in paradise with Christ, in bliss, not in suffering and in struggle. And we too know that. That is why we can rejoice. And here it says, Paul says that Christ will be exalted in his body, whether by life or by death, so that when he is alive, he lives solely, purposefully, only for Christ, and is a fruitful labor for him, and it is necessary to remain for the sake of the people so that he's able to boast in Christ and to encourage and help progress and the joy in the faith to impact many more lives in his lifetime. And today after when we are born again, we are living with Christ in us and we are living for Christ. So daily let us die to our old self and raise to the newness of life. That is more important. If we do not die to our old self, then it's very hard to propagate this gospel truth. We are hindering ourselves. And sometimes I also think that oh, we have still many more time. We have more, so much more time to share this gospel to this person, to the other person. Let me wait until I have the time. Let me put aside my busy schedule, then one day, if I'm not that busy, I can speak to that person, I can share to that person. But death comes like a thief, and we do not know when is their last breath. So we too ought to, regardless, regardless of any situation, any circumstances, we ought to share this gospel truth to the people around us. And to know that this gospel can set us free. What more? If I share this gospel to another person, it will set that person free as well. Amen? And that should be the burden in our hearts. And when we daily know how to die to this side of this world, then we are able to live out the life worthy of this gospel. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16 to 18, it says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. God bless his word. And this speaks about the hope. Because daily we see our body wasting away, right? As time goes, we see our body wasting away. We see our parents getting old. We see our grandparents getting older. And then you see that, wow, your cousin also have children already. Then you'll be like uncle, aunties. Some might be grand, aunt, grand. <laughs> so it's like time is passing so fast. But we as a born-again child of God, we do not need to lose heart. Even though we see all of this world is going downwards, but we have a greater hope. Even though this outer man is wasting away, this world is perishing, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. And we know that Christ and the eternal glory that is waiting for us, that will not perish that was perfect from the beginning. Until we meet Christ face to face, it will be perfect until the end. And even though sometimes it might be very challenging on this side of this world, but it says that for our light affliction, as what Sister Ern has shared previously, for this light affliction, but for a moment, all of these small, small things, 
We ought to endure. We ought to persevere. We ought to hold on to this faith because there is far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory awaiting for us. Because all of the things that is seen will perish one day. But those things that are unseen is eternal in nature. And we place our faith and our hope on the things unseen. As how we believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection has saved us so wonderfully, we too believe in God's promises so that we have that hope beyond the grave. Amen? And previously it says to live is Christ, to die is gain, right? So to live is Christ, once we know that this life is only in Christ and through Christ alone, then in Philippians 1, verse 27 to 29 is for us. Only be sure as citizens so to conduct yourself that your manner of life will be worthy of the good news, the gospel of Christ. So that whether I do come and see you or an absent, I may hear this of you, that you are standing firm in united spirit and purpose, striving side by side and contending with a single mind for the faith of the glad tidings, the gospel. And do not for a moment be frightened or intimidated in anything by your opponents and adversary, for such constancy and fearlessness will be a clear sign, proof and seal to them of their impending destruction, but a sure token and evidence of your deliverance and salvation, and that from God. For you have been granted the privilege of Christ's sake, not only to believe in, adhere to, rely on, and trust in Him, but also to suffer in His behalf. Amen. God bless His word. So as citizens of heaven, like we said, we are sojourners on this side of this world, we are citizens of heaven, let us live a life worthy of this gospel and let us all Stand firm and be united in the spirit. Uh, Single-mindedness contending for this gospel truth. Because in verse 28, it says that do not for a moment be frightened or intimidated by, by, by whatever comes at you because it is a clear sign of their destruction. But those who hold on to this faith, it is a clear sign of your perfect salvation that Christ will come back for us one day. And when we hold on to that faith, we know the more we hold on, the more we are assured, the more we hold on to His promises, the more we have that hope beyond the grave, knowing that Christ will come back for us. One day, we might pass first, or the tribulation might come first. Either of it, we are not scared because we have this gospel truth. The gospel of God's righteousness, which comprises of Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, that is the one that gives you that hope. A bold hope, knowing that whatever circumstances, you can hold on to Christ. And Christ will bring you back hope. Amen? And in verse 29, it says, in, if you read in other translations, it says that, it is a privilege for us not only to believe and to trust in Him, but to also share His suffering. Sometimes we always want to believe and trust in God for this and that, all the good things. God, give me blessing. God, help my path to be straight. Help my path to be a smooth journey. But in Philippians, when I read this, it actually dawned to my mind that it is a privilege for us to believe in the righteousness of God, to trust in Him, rely on Him. He will, because the Holy Spirit in, is in us, we have the Comforter, the Counselor, but also we are privileged to suffer with Christ. Whatever, that is why in verse 30 it says, uh, Paul says that all the sufferings that he has went through, we too one day will also suffer that suffering. But to him, it is a joyful occasion. There is so much joy in him that he can praise God. Even in the prison, 
even at his point of death, he did not give up and say that, oh, why? Why am I ought to die this way in Christ? But because of the ever-living hope that he has, that's why he can say to live is Christ, to die is gain. And we too ought to exemplify him, knowing that we have the privilege not only to believe in this gospel truth, but also to share Christ's suffering. Amen? And I would like to encourage you with this verse. In Romans 15 verse 13, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this scripture plainly speaks about our God is a God of hope. And that God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace, not like the world gives. And even through any situation, you can rejoice and you can be at peace in believing in Him. And that you may abound in hope. God wants us to abound in hope. That hope must increase in you as you grow older and older, as you grow in the Spirit, because it is the power of the Holy Spirit. So daily when we tap to walk in the Spirit, we have that abounding hope in us, that assurance of hope in us. Amen? Amen.